right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining today's webinar. This is a webinar on AmeriCorps state and national evaluation requirements. My name is Sarah Yu. I'm the program impact manager for AmeriCorps state and national, and I will be the voice that you hear on today's webinar. But I would really like to hear from you as well. I know you've used the chat box so far. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask you to switch over to the question and answer box in Zoom. Uh, that is different, different place in the chat box. That's the best place to type your questions as we go through the webinar. Uh, I'll be watching for those, I'll pause as needed to answer questions as they come in, and then there'll also be time for additional questions at the end of the webinar. So what you see on this slide is a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. We'll start with the definition and types of evaluation, talk about the AmeriCorps state and national evaluation requirements, alternative evaluation approach or AEA requests and how they work, evaluation policy guidance and some updates to that guidance, resources to support evaluation efforts, and then we'll wrap up with how to share evaluation guidance and resources with subgrantees and sites. Let's start with the definition of evaluation straight from the AmeriCorps regulations from 45 CFR 2522.2. 700. This is a quote from those regulations. I won't read the whole thing to you, but a couple of highlights from this. Evaluation in this definition uses scientifically based research methods. Evaluation compares outcomes for those who were involved in, in an intervention versus those who were not. And evaluation should test for a causal relationship between program activities and program outcomes. This definition in the AmeriCorps regulations also points out that there's a difference between evaluation and performance measurement. Performance measures capture output and outcome data, but unlike evaluation, performance measurement doesn't assess the theory of change that underlies those outputs and outcomes. Now, those of you who are familiar with evaluation lingo, which I know there are some folks on the phone here and the, on the webinar here who are, will probably have noticed that the definition of evaluation in the AmeriCorps regulations specifically refers to an impact evaluation. Impact evaluations are the only kind of evaluation that is able to test for that causal relationship between activities and outcomes. In other words, figure out whether the program activities were actually responsible for any positive changes that we might see in individuals, in organizations, or in communities. And impact evaluations do that by comparing an experimental group, which is the group that actually receives an intervention, with a control or a comparison group. The control or comparison group has to be as similar as possible to the group that gets the intervention. So it needs to be selected in a special way. One way to do that is by randomly assigning individuals or organizations to either the experimental or control group. That would be called a randomized control trial or RCT for short. Another approach is to do statistical matching between the experimental group and a comparison group. This is what we call a quasi-experimental design or QED for short. There is a lot of value in doing an impact evaluation that can tell you whether the things you are doing in your program are having the effect you want them to have. We believe that all programs should eventually think about doing this kind of evaluation. However, uh, CNCS does recognize that an impact evaluation isn't right for all programs at all points in their life cycle. So the evaluation menu, as it were, for AmeriCorps state and national grantees includes other available options too, based on the grant type, the grant size, and program design. An outcome evaluation, which is the second thing you see on the slide here, is similar in some ways to an impact evaluation, in that they both measure the outcomes of program activities. However, an outcome evaluation does not have that experimental design, the RCT, or the quasi-experimental QED design. So outcome evaluations can't assess whether or not program activities actually caused the outcomes that you would be seeing. A non-experimental outcome evaluation may have a comparison group, but it wouldn't be randomly assigned or statistically matched and some outcome evaluations don't actually have comparison groups at all. A process evaluation, which is the last one you see on the slide here, 
is designed to look at the way a program is working in practice. This type of evaluation might assess whether a program is reaching the beneficiaries it intended to reach, or whether it is following a particular program model with fidelity. Evaluations can be conducted either by the staff of your own organization or by someone external to your organization. An, or, an evaluation that's conducted by an external evaluator is referred to in the AmeriCorps regulations as an independent evaluation. <clears throat> Excuse me. The external evaluator really does need to be truly independent. In other words, the evaluator should not have a relationship or a stake in the project or in the grantee organization. For grantees of certain types and certain sizes, the AmeriCorps regulations require an independent evaluation. Now, in contrast, an internal evaluation can be conducted in-house. However, uh, the internal evaluator should still strive to be as objective as possible and also should have training and experience with evaluation. So although some kinds and some types and sizes of grants are allowed to have internal rather than independent evaluations, Grantees can always choose to do an external or independent evaluation, even if they're not specifically required to. Evaluation requirements are written into the AmeriCorps regulations as part of the fundamental design of AmeriCorps State and National. And there are really good reasons for this. When it's done well, evaluation can help you figure out what's working and what's not working in your program or your subgrantee programs, and what you can do to make the program better. Evaluation can also help build the evidence base for effective program models, and those models can then be shared uh, or replicated in other settings. So evaluation is really useful and useful not just to CNCS, but also to grantee programs themselves. Now the details of the evaluation requirements for AmeriCorps grants do depend on several factors. You see the factors on the bottom of the slide. Type of funding, type of grant, size of grant, and program history. We will spend the next couple of slides talking about each of these factors. First factor is the type of funding the grantee receives. Grantees that receive funding directly from CNCS are required to conduct evaluations with each grant cycle, starting after the first cycle, and then submit evaluation reports the next time they recompete for funding. When I say direct grantee, uh, that includes multi-state national direct grantees, Indian tribe grantees, and single state grantees that operate in states or territories that don't have commissions. The evaluation requirements for competitive state subgrantees are the same as for direct grantees. Now, in contrast, state formula grantees do not have evaluation requirements specified by CNCS. Instead, formula subgrantees need to follow the evaluation requirements that are established by their state commission. Now, as many of you may know uh, from experience, especially the commission staff that are on the webinar today, uh, some commission subgrantees move relatively frequently between competitive and formula and back again. And it can be hard for those subgrantees to maintain continuity in their, in their evaluation efforts. So CNCS encourages commissions to develop evaluation requirements for your formula subgrantees that will keep them on track to meet competitive evaluation requirements as well. Since the vast majority of CNCS's evaluation requirements are specifically for competitive grantees, we're going to focus only on competitive grantees for the next couple of slides. Within that category of competitive grants, the type of grant also affects evaluation requirements. Cost reimbursement grantees and full cost fixed amount grantees, which refers to fixed amount grantees whose cost per MSY is $800 or more, or more than $800, I should say, um, have evaluation requirements that depend on the overall size of the grant. Larger grants require independent evaluations. Smaller grants may choose to do internal evaluations. EAP grants, or grants that have a cost per MSY of $800 or less, are allowed to do internal evaluations regardless of the total overall size of the grant. 
The dividing line between what we call a large grantee and a small grantee is specified again in the AmeriCorps regulations, and that dividing line is $500,000. A grant size of $500,000 or more per year, that's a CNCS share specifically, um, is considered large, and less than $500,000 per year in CNCS share is considered small. So for competitive non-EAP grants, I know that's a lot of um, qualifiers, but, uh, but this does get uh, very specific. So for competitive non-EAP grants, a large grantee, so over 500K, uh, is required to do an independent impact evaluation, while a small grantee, less than 500,000, can choose either an independent or an internal evaluation. Again, to say more about grant size specifically, we calculate it as the average yearly CNCS funding received during the grant cycle in which the evaluation is conducted. That calculation will factor in any funding increases or decreases that might happen in continuation years two or three for the grant. This is a slightly different methodology than was used in the past, and so we'll talk about this again later in the presentation and talk about how this change is going to be handled for current grantees. A program's competitive funding history also affects its evaluation requirements. Competitive grantees are not required to conduct an evaluation during the first three years of their program life cycle, so the first three-year grant cycle. And that's because the program model is often not yet stable enough at that point to make, it, to make sense to evaluate it. However, new competitive grantees should be using those first three years wisely to set up strong data collection systems and to lay the groundwork for their first evaluation. To support that process, new grantees are asked to submit a data collection plan with their application. After three years of competitive funding, grantees need to submit an evaluation plan with their next recompete application for the same project. I'm not going to define same project right now, but there is a specific uh, link in the regulations that will give you the specifics on what same project means in this context. So after three years of funding, submit an evaluation plan with the next recompete application. The evaluation plan is reviewed by CNCS and needs to be approved within the first year of the grant award. Uh, some of you have been through this process. Uh, it may involve revising and resubmitting the evaluation plan one or more times in response to the feedback that you receive from CNCS. Once the evaluation plan is approved, then that evaluation needs to be implemented during that three-year grant cycle. The evaluation needs to follow the approved plan, and it needs to be completed in time to submit it with the next recompete application. After six years of competitive funding, or two grant cycles, uh, the pattern will stay the same for each subsequent competitive grant cycle. Applicants need to submit their most recently completed evaluation report, the one that corresponds to their last grant cycle, with their recomplete, recompete application. The report is assessed as part of the grant application review process, and grantees that do not submit complete and high quality evaluation reports may be less likely to be selected for competitive funding. Applicants also need to submit an evaluation plan for the next three-year grant cycle, and again, that will be reviewed and approved by CNCS. Now, we do not expect grantees, and grantees should not, conduct the same kind of evaluation over and over again. That's not helpful for us uh, or for you. Uh, instead, each evaluation plan should build on the findings from previous evaluations. For example, uh, a subsequent evaluation could explore a particular component of a program in greater depth, or look at the effectiveness of the program with different populations, or maybe conduct a cost-benefit analysis. Lots of different options for where to go with that. But always, just like with that first evaluation, the goal of all of these subsequent evaluation efforts is to strengthen the program's evidence base and make continuous improvements to the program. So as you've seen in, the, in these previous slides, uh, a grantee's evaluation requirements can vary significantly depending on type, size, and history of the grant. But there are some requirements that all competitive grantees have in common. The activities and outcomes assessed by the evaluation need to be a significant part of the program design. 
Unlike performance measures, grantees aren't required to connect their evaluation to their self-defined primary service activity necessarily. However, the evaluation needs to be clearly linked to the program's theory of change and logic model. The evaluation needs to cover at least one year of CNCS funded activity for the same project. One year in this context doesn't necessarily mean 12 months like a calendar year. It refers to activities that take place during a program year, but the, the number of months is, is not the important part. It also doesn't matter which specific program year or years is assessed, again, as long as it is connected to the same project. And the evaluation needs to cover activities that take place at one or more sites that are supported under that specific grant. There are some AmeriCorps program models that are supported by multiple legal grants to the same organization. And it may make sense for them, and often does make sense, for them to synchronize their evaluation efforts for those grants. That's, that's a fine thing to do. However, the evaluation for one legal grant can't be used to meet the requirements for a different legal grant unless the evaluation includes one or more sites from each grant. So again, activities that take place and are supported by each of the grants. CNCS started reviewing and approving evaluation plans for competitive grantees in 2018. So again, many of you on this webinar may have gone through that process already. Grantees who have approved plans in place need to follow those plans when they conduct their evaluations. When they recompete again and there are reviewers assessing evaluation reports that are submitted by those recompeting grantees, the reviewers will be looking to make sure that the completed reports align with the approved plan. And finally, submitted evaluation reports <clears throat> need to adequately describe the context, methodology, and findings of the evaluation. Later in this webinar, uh, we'll talk about evaluation resources there's a link there to an online training about what to include in an evaluation report. So we've just gone over a lot of things, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of elements of the evaluation framework for AmeriCorps state and national grants. I am pausing to take a quick look at the question and answer. Looks like we don't have any open questions at the moment, so please don't be shy. Uh, if this is uh, a lot to, to swallow, and if you have some questions or need something restated, you know, please feel free to, to put a question in the question and answer box. Um, but while we're waiting for any potential questions to come in, let's go ahead and do a little bit of practice together, figuring out or practicing figuring out what the evaluation requirements will be for individual grant applicants. The things to consider are the things that we just talked about, the type of grants, the size of the grants, and the applicant's program history. And just to add one more layer, layer of, of, of interesting challenge, uh, we'll need to consider most of these things, not only for the submitted grant application itself, but also for the most recent competitive grant cycle for the same project. So let's dive into that and take a look at example one. A state subgrantee is in their third year of competitive funding after having been funded in formula for six years. In their current competitive grant cycle, the subgrantee is receiving $325,000 in CNCS funding per year through a cost reimbursement grant. The subgrantee is requesting the same amount per year in their recompete application, but is switching to a full cost fixed amount grant. Adding a table here at the bottom, just to summarize what we can learn from this example, the main points that come from the example text. The applicant's most recent competitive grant was cost reimbursement and had an average grant size, again, CNCS share of 325K per year. The submitted grant application requests that same amount of money, 325,000 per year, but is full cost fixed amount. So in eGrants, this will make this grant application look like a new application but it is actually not. It will still meet the definition of same project from the AmeriCorps regulations. So that means that the program history counts. The program history for this applicant is three previous years of competitive funding. You'll notice in the example, it also talked about formula funding. That is not considered in determining CNCS evaluation requirements. It may still be considered by the commission when they set their own state specific requirements.
So putting all that together, uh, the evaluation requirement for this applicant is that they will need to submit an evaluation plan for either an internal or an independent evaluation. They're not going to be required to conduct an independent impact evaluation since they're requesting less than $500,000 per year from CNCF. And because this applicant only completed three years of competitive funding, they weren't expected to complete an evaluation during that first three-year cycle, so no evaluation report is required by CNCS at this point. Keep in mind, though, that depending on the policies set by the State Commission, the subgrantee may have additional evaluation requirements that go beyond what is listed here. Great, we're getting some questions in, I love that. Let's do one more example, and then I'll take a couple of these questions um, before we move on with some other content. So example number two, a national direct grantee has operated the EnviroCorps program for the past 15 years. This year, they have acquired a new partner and are proposing to expand their project to two new states and increase the size of their cost reimbursement CNCS grant from 400,000 to $600,000 per year. Their recompete application also describes adjustments to member training and supervision, plus a shift in the way environmental improvements will be assessed by the program. So we'll do the same thing we did in the previous example and do some summarizing of the main information provided in the example. So we've got cost reimbursement grants for both the previous and the current grant application. Uh, the size of the grant is increasing from $400,000 to $600,000 per year. Regarding the program history, uh, while the applicant is proposing some minor changes to their program implementation, uh, the changes are not enough to make the applicant fall outside the definition of same project in the regulations. So that means that that 15 years of competitive funding history still does count and is listed here in this chart as program history. If the program wants to challenge that and they want to say that the changes really are significant enough to qualify them to be considered as a new project with respect to this evaluation, then they will need to submit what's called an alternative evaluation approach or AEA request. And I promise we will talk more about that very shortly in the presentation. All right, so we've got some good questions. Let's uh, pause for a moment and take a look at some of these questions. So it looks like the first question is from Stephanie, and it says, if our organization has multiple sites and only some are AmeriCorps sites, does that mean we need to have a separate evaluation for AmeriCorps sites specifically? Uh, so I guess the answer is yes and no. So an evaluation that would be done on this project to meet, to meet the AmeriCorps evaluation requirements would need to include at least one site that has AmeriCorps program activity. So at least one site that's supported under the AmeriCorps grant. That does not mean that you can't include other sites. You absolutely can. Um, this could be a multi-site evaluation. Some of the sites may not be supported by AmeriCorps, uh, and that's fine. But again, to meet the evaluation requirement, it has to have at least one site supported by the AmeriCorps grant. So thanks for that question, Stephanie. Second question is from Anonymous. It says, if a program is moving from formula to competitive, do they still have the first year competitive evaluation requirements, even though the program is not in its first year of operation? So the answer to that is yes. When we look at the evaluation requirements that CNCS mandates or that our regulations mandate, it looks only at competitive program history. So although formula program history is important, um, although the commission may have evaluation requirements themselves related to that formula history, for CNCS purposes, if this is the first time in competitive funding, then it would be considered a first year evaluation requirement, meaning they wouldn't need to submit an evaluation plan or report at that point. Question from Mira Coalition says, what is the timeline for evaluation plan and reports to be submitted? Uh, we're applying for our fourth cycle of competitive funding and are wondering if the finished report will be submitted at, at the same time as the recomplete, recompete application, which will include evaluation plan. So the short answer is yes, the, uh, the, if the application deadline and the application process is the time and place when evaluation plan and evaluation reports are submitted. So if you look at the notice of funding opportunity, the 2020 notice of funding opportunity is out right now. Uh, if you look at the instructions in there for submitting additional documents, uh, it will walk you through the process for submitting an evaluation report along with your application. 
evaluation plan is actually submitted in the text of the application itself. There's a special section of the application for that. So thanks for that question. Another anonymous question says, if a program wants to change their evaluation, is there a process for revising their previously approved evaluation plan? And is there a certain amount of change that requires new approval? So yes, uh, if you have an approved evaluation plan and you would like to make changes to it, uh, you can propose changes to that plan. Uh, there is a mailbox evaluation plans at cns.gov. Uh, you can submit your proposed changes to that plan. They will go through a review process, just like the review process for your original evaluation plan. And then we will let you know from that same mailbox if the changes are approved or not. Uh, if they're not approved, you need to continue implementing your current approved plan. If they are approved, you can switch to the revised plan. Question from Channing. Uh, can you talk more about technical assistance that CNCS provides for evaluations? Yes, we can. There is actually a whole slide on this uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so uh, stay tuned, Channing, and, and we will get to this shortly. Let's do one more and then we'll take some more questions a little bit later. Uh, would you please describe, redescribe the primary changes to the evaluation requirements and guidance that are going to, into effect this year compared to past years? Eva, thank you for that question. I am about to do exactly that. So that's a great uh, segue uh, to what's coming up very shortly in the presentation. All right, so let's pause here for a moment. Thank you guys, great questions. Uh, we will we'll pick this up again in a little bit. Meanwhile, uh, let's talk about alternative evaluation. Wait, where were we? Alternative evaluation approaches. No, I just cut myself off in the middle of the other example. Let's finish up the other example. Uh, we were talking about this applicant that had the 15 years of competitive funding history. Uh, their evaluation requirement, which I know you were on the edge to find out what it actually was. Uh, the next slide will show you what it actually was, uh, which is that they are required to submit both an evaluation report uh, and an evaluation plan. So the evaluation report uh, could be either an internal or an independent evaluation uh, because the applicant was less than $500,000 per year in CNCS funding. Um, and so they had the option of which kind of evaluation to conduct. Uh, the applicant also needs to submit an evaluation plan for the upcoming three-year grant cycle. Um, this one needs to be an independent impact evaluation, and that's because the grantee is proposing a budget of $600,000 per year, which will qualify the grantee as large. All right, sorry to uh, pause in the middle of that uh, example. Hopefully that still made sense to folks. Let me know in the, in the Q&A box if it did not. But let's go on and talk about the alternative evaluation approaches. Uh, I've mentioned that a couple of times now. Uh, these are designed for situations where the usual evaluation requirements don't work uh, or are not appropriate for a grantee's individual circumstances. Uh, and there are four bases on which an AEA can be granted. The first would be the structure of the AmeriCorps program or grantee organization. For example, a program design that makes it impossible to form a comparison group because of the, the nature of the intervention, uh, or a program that's recently undergone major structural shifts. A second uh, type of AEA, a second, second basis for an AEA would be having completed a previous impact evaluation that was of satisfactory quality and also qualified the grantee for the moderate or strong evidence tier. A third basis would be an applicant that is replicating an evidence-based intervention with fidelity at a new site. And then a fourth basis would be an evaluation that requires an extended period of time for data collection, and so it cannot be completed in time to be submitted with the next recompete application. More details about each of these bases and what the uh, uh, qualifications would be for the AEA for each of these types are in that AEA guidance. You see the link at the bottom of the slide here. I do want to note that AEAs are only in effect for a single grant cycle. They only apply to one three-year grant cycle. So if an alternative evaluation approach is still necessary when a grantee next recompetes for funding, then the grantee needs to reapply for the AEA as part of their recompete application. And again, that guidance on the bottom of the slide will show you how to request an AEA. Generally, AEAs are requested along with recompete applications as well. 
All right, so evaluation policy guidance, uh, as you guys know, because you got some emails on this, and, and this is the, the reason we're having this webinar today, CNCS did update our evaluation policy guidance for AmeriCorps state and national grantees in October 2019, in this month. You will find the updated guidance in the evaluation FAQs and also in the AEA guidance that I just mentioned. Both of those are located on the CNCS evaluation policies web page, which is the, uh, the hyperlink to that is up at the top of this slide. You also should have gotten those updated documents by email from the ASN information email box earlier this month. But we had someone who uh, wanted to know what the most significant updates were. So again, thank you for that question. And this is the slide where we get to talk about that. I do want to start by saying that the evaluation requirements for AmeriCorps state and national grantees are set in regulation, and those regulations have not changed. So fundamentally, AmeriCorps state and national evaluation requirements are the same. They have not changed. What we have updated is our policy guidance on how to implement those regulations. And in the process of doing that updates, we made a couple of changes. So this slide and the next slide will share those most significant updates to the policy guidance. First, as I mentioned earlier, the updated policy guidance redefines the grant size calculation to be based on the grant cycle during which the evaluation is implemented, not the preceding grant cycle. The reason for this change is to align the required type of evaluation with the funding that CNCS is actually providing you to support that evaluation. Since this is a change in definition, that will mean that some grantees, current grantees, who were originally categorized as small for your current grant cycle may now be recategorized as large and vice versa. So I wanna reassure you that current grantees are not going to be asked to change your evaluation plans now. If you are an existing grantee that uh, based on this change in calculation is being redefined from small to large, you will be automatically granted an AEA, an alternative evaluation approach, so that you can continue your existing evaluation without needing to switch mid-cycle right now to an independent impact evaluation. Now, if you want to do that, you certainly may, but you won't be required to do that. The AEA will apply to the current grant cycle only, so all grantees will need to follow the updated grant size calculation when they recompete for funding in 2020 and beyond. The second significant update uh, is that uh, the updated policy removes the requirement to submit an AEA request in order to conduct an AmeriCorps member-focused evaluation. Grantees for whom member development is a significant part of your program design and whose logic model includes member outcomes can conduct an evaluation focused on member impact without needing prior approval from CNCS. But I do want to say that uh, grantees should keep in mind it's important to build a robust body of evidence to support outcomes for program beneficiaries. This is an important aspect of the competitive grant application review process, something that CNCS values. So just something to keep in mind as you're deciding what aspect of your program to evaluate. Third significant change in the evaluation policy guidance relates to grantees who have already completed an impact evaluation for their project. Those grantees will no longer be automatically exempt from the requirement to complete another impact evaluation. Instead, any large grantee who wishes to conduct a non-impact evaluation will need to request an AEA. And in order for the AEA to be approved, the grantee's recompete application must have been assessed as having moderate or strong evidence and must have satisfactory evidence quality. Now, a number of grantees who previously conducted impact evaluations, again, current grantees, have already been given exemptions for the current grant cycle. And those exemptions will remain in effect. So again, I wanna reassure you on that. If you've gotten an exemption already, that's going to stay in effect. You, you and other grantees in this situation will receive automatic AEAs, again, for the current grant cycle only, so you can continue your existing evaluation without needing to switch right now to an impact evaluation but all grantees will need to follow the updated guidance when recompeting for funding in 2020 and beyond.
All right, uh, we're going to talk about resources in a moment. That's the next slide you see here, and that's fine. Uh, let's pause here uh, for a moment to take a look at some other questions. Let's see, we've got a question from C. Patton. Can you restate the qualifier for this? Evaluations of sites supported under a different grant will not meet the evaluation requirement. I think I heard you say that if multiple sites from each grant are represented, it will meet the requirements. Yes, that's, that's correct. So let me see if I can say this in a way that's clear. Uh, in order for an evaluation to meet the evaluation requirement for a particular grant, at least one site that's supported by that grant needs to be part of the evaluation. So you can have one evaluation that actually meets the evaluation requirement for multiple grants, because that one evaluation may have may evaluate multiple sites, each of which is supported by a different grant. So there's no reason why you can't consolidate evaluation efforts if you are an organization that has multiple grants or multiple locations around the country. Just make sure that if you want an evaluation to meet the requirements for a particular grant, at least one site supported by that grant is in there. Hopefully that helps. Let me know if not. Uh, for Anonymous, again, we submitted our original evaluation plan at the time of Recompete and received a few follow-up questions, which we've been working on addressing. However, we also received an opportunity to do a slightly different evaluation and would prefer to alter our original evaluation plan substantially. Is that an option since we are still within that first year of submitting? Yes, that is still an option. Um, I would recommend, and, and we'll talk about this momentarily, recommend that you reach out quickly to our evaluation technical assistance provider, NORC, talk to them about what you are thinking of doing, what this opportunity is, to see whether this makes sense, whether this will meet your evaluation requirements um, you know, before you go too far down that road. But since you are still within that first year, you know, that is the first year uh, is the year in which you can take the time to finalize your evaluation plan and get it approved. So this is the right time to make that change if it's the right answer for you. So, so do reach out to NORC about that. And thanks for the question. Uh, can you make changes to your evaluation plan during the continuation process as well? You can, um, but at that stage, you would need to do it through the evaluation plans mailbox. So um, the continuation application process does not include a re-review of the evaluation plans field in the application. So if you decide around the time of continuation that you want to change your plan, again, submit your proposed modifications to evaluation plans at cns.gov and we'll, we'll handle it that way. Thanks for the question. Question from another anonymous. We recently completed an impact evaluation with SIF funding. Would we be required to do another impact evaluation if we fall into that category? Can we explore another question with an external evaluation like quasi-experimental? Uh, so I would say again that um, previously completing an impact evaluation of a program does not anymore automatically exempt you from completing another impact evaluation. But you can submit an AEA request if the evaluation was in fact of your AmeriCorps supported program. Um, and if you uh, were assessed as having moderate or strong evidence, in your recompete application, if your evidence quality was sufficient, um, then you could be considered for an AEA. I do want to note that quasi-experimental is still, generally speaking, an impact evaluation. Uh, a randomized controlled trial, RCT, uh, is not the only kind of evaluation that can be considered an impact evaluation. So uh, talk more with NORC um, about what you're proposing. It could be that it actually would be an impact evaluation, even though it's not randomized controlled trial. So thanks for that question. Question from Kate, what is the timeline on which we can expect to receive evaluation plan review feedback and or approval? Uh, it will depend on the complexity of your evaluation plan. It will depend on the extent of changes that are requested or the changes that you are making in the current uh, version that you've submitted. It will also frankly depend on the time of year because there are uh, high seasons for getting evaluation plans. Uh, and, and low seasons, so, so there's not one timeline, I guess, is the answer. Certainly our goal is to get you feedback as quickly as we can. Uh, if you are concerned that maybe something fell through the cracks and that you're not getting feedback uh, in, a, in a time that is helpful for you, you can, you can reach out again to the evaluation plans mailbox and just check in uh, on the status of your review. Feel free to do that. Uh, I will say, too, that the, the deadline to receive approval for the evaluation plan is about a year after grant award, specifically the end of August of the following year, um, is the deadline to get that approval done. So you know, let's 
do, do move forward with all deliberate speed in doing your revisions. And if you're concerned about a lag time in the review, go ahead and reach out. So thanks for the question. Uh, question from Laura, could an AEA be reviewed and approved outside of a grant application? Uh, in some cases, yes, it could. Um, that would be another case where you would reach out to the evaluation plans mailbox with your AEA request and with the uh, proposed revisions to your evaluation plan. The AEA guidance actually describes in detail how you do that. So go ahead and take a look at that guidance for more details about how that's done. Thanks for that question. Question from Jesse, does the program year being evaluated need to occur within the three-year grant cycle? The answer is no. It needs to be the same project. Again, there's a regulatory definition for same project, um, so please do look at that definition. But as long as what you are evaluating is the same project, uh, you don't need to evaluate activity that occurs within that particular three-year grant cycle. So thank you for that question. Uh, let's do one more for now, and then we'll move on and talk about some resources, come back at the end for any additional questions. Is the rule that a grant-funded site be in, is the rule that a grant-funded site be included in a nationally-based evaluation a new rule? No, that is not a new rule. We have uh, implemented that for a number of years. That's not one of the policy changes that's been made this fall. All right, thank you. Great question. So please keep the questions coming. Let's take a look uh, here on the slide of resources that CNCS makes available to support grantee evaluations. The picture that you see on this slide is the evaluation resources and training page. And uh, one of the great things on this page is a series of online courses on evaluation, which we call the evaluation core curriculum. That cycle that you see on the slide is clickable. If you click on one of those boxes, uh, it will take you to the courses that relates to that part of the evaluation process. So there's planning, implementation, analysis, and reporting and using evaluation results for action and improvement. Each of those stages has multiple courses and also some activities associated with it. So please do check that out if you have not already. And in addition to that, CNCS offers personalized individual technical assistance on evaluation for all competitively funded grantees and subgrantees. Hopefully this is not new news to you, but I'm guessing it might be for some folks on the, on the webinar. So this is great news for all of you that this resource is available. We have a technical assistance provider, NORC. They are available for one-on-one -on -one consultations and coaching on topics like evaluation design and approach, data collection tools, data analysis procedures, guidance on how to identify an external evaluator, and also assistance with development or revision of an evaluation plan. This is a free resource, free to you. Uh, there is also no limit to the number of times a grantee or a subgrantee can reach out for assistance. On this slide on the bottom, you will see the link to the Technical Assistance or TA portal where competitive grantees and competitive subgrantees can send their questions or requests. I think, though I am not sure, that uh, some NORC representatives are actually listening in on this webinar. So hi, folks, if you are in fact there. Uh, they will be glad to respond to your evaluation-related questions via the TA portal after the webinar concludes. With the 2020 AmeriCorps State and National Competitive Application Deadline approaching soon, this is a particularly good time to reach out to NORC for help and advice on developing your evaluation plans. Since evaluation plans are not scored competitively and are not reviewed by CNCS until after funding decisions are made, there are actually no restrictions on the guidance that NORC can provide on evaluation plans right now. So if you need help getting started or want NORC to review a draft plan before you submit it, please do reach out to them. And a preview of coming attractions next week, November 7th, uh, there will be a webinar, another one, on best practices for writing an evaluation plan. So please plan to tune in for that. One important note uh, for the state commissions on the call, your subgrantees need to consult with you before they submit a request to NORC through the TA portal. And we will be looping you in on any technical assistance provided to your subgrantees. We also encourage you to use your commission investment fund, your KIF resources, to provide evaluation TA to your subgrantees and not just rely on the NORC TA portal.
Now, those of you participating today are likely, you know, probably you are either commission representatives or staff of direct grantees. But it's essential that you also share this evaluation guidance with your sub-grantees and your operating sites. It is the responsibility of all prime grantees, uh, both direct grantees and state commissions, to train your sub-grantees on CNCS evaluation requirements and best practices to support your subgrantees on evaluation planning and implementation, including for commissions through the commission investment fund resources that you receive. Uh, it's your responsibility to include evaluation requirements as part of your review process for subapplicants in your state. And most importantly, it's your responsibility to help your subgrantees learn from the results of their evaluations and to use those findings to make their programs stronger. So please do reach out to your program officer or your portfolio manager if you'd like additional guidance on how to fulfill that prime grantee responsibility. So with that, uh, let's go back to the question box. There's a couple of open questions, but this is your moment. We've got about 10 minutes left. So if you have other questions that you'd like to ask about evaluation requirements, evaluation policy, et cetera, um, uh, please feel free to type those into the question and answer box. Anonymous attendee says, you've mentioned a CNCS evaluation mailbox email address and then the NORC team. What is the difference between who it, when to contact each of these parties for guidance? Great question. So if you want guidance and advice and technical assistance on evaluation, you should contact NORC through the evaluation TA portal. That's what that is for, specifically for TA guidance help with evaluation. If you are submitting evaluation plan revisions or other kinds of official requests related to evaluation requirements, then that goes to the evaluation plans at cns.gov mailbox. That, that box was specifically set up to manage the evaluation plan review and approval process. So that is the primarily anything related to your evaluation plan approval is what goes to that box. Next question, can you clarify that evaluation plans are due with the recompete application? Yes, that is correct. Uh, with a couple of caveats, um, the, the initial uh, draft, the initial version of your evaluation plan should be actually entered into the text of the recompete al application in the evaluation summary or plan field in the application, and it should be submitted that way. Likely, if you are asked to revise and resubmit your evaluation, you'll be asked to do that outside of the application. You'll be asked to do that in a word processing software to track the changes that you make and to submit that as an attachment to that evaluation plans mailbox. And that's why the evaluation plans mailbox exists, um, just because it gives you more flexibility to do the revisions on the more iterative back and forth way that these evaluation plan approvals happen. So again, initial evaluation plans are due with the recompete application at the time that the application is submitted on your application deadline. Revised plans are submitted outside of the application. Question from Jesse, what portion of the evaluation needs to be conducted by an external evaluator to be considered independent? For example, could the data be collected internally but given to the evaluator to analyze uh, I am going to actually pass this question off to my colleague, Roshni Menon, from the Office of Research and Evaluation, who is here and is giving me the high sign. So go ahead, Roshni, you can answer that one. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I would say uh, all of the evaluation would need to be conducted by the external party, because if you're collecting the data and passing it on to an external evaluator, it could be said that you, know, you chose whom you collected data from. So it's not truly independent. So I think that this, Jesse, is probably a topic that you'll want to discuss in greater detail with NORC. So if you're not already in conversations with them, go ahead and submit an evaluation TA request because it sounds like this might be a, a bigger story that we should talk about more. And this is exactly the reason why NORC is there uh, to answer these kinds of specific questions. All right, question. Uh, we are now working with NORC on some technical assistance. Are they the evaluation plan approvers as well? The evaluation plan approval is handled through CNCS. Uh, the NORC technical assistance is separate from that. So question from Mira Coalition. The last evaluation plan and report for my program was submitted before we transitioned staff. When and how would we have received confirmation that our plan for subsequent three years was approved? 
Uh, if you are uncertain what, the, what your evaluation plan approval status is, if you've had some staff turnover, go ahead and email evaluationplans at cns.gov and we can help you with that. We can help you figure out what the last correspondence was about your evaluation plan and uh, get you the information you need on that. Question from Eva, where can we see examples of independent impact evaluations related to AmeriCorps member outcomes? Uh, I would say that your best resource is going to be the CNCS Evidence Exchange, which you can also find if you go a couple slides back and look at the evaluation technical assistance resources. Um, on that evaluation resources page, you will find a link to our online evidence exchange that has evaluation reports, they're searchable, um, so you can take a look for evaluation reports of the kind that you're looking for. All right, I am looking for any other questions. I don't see any at the moment, but uh, I will talk slowly for a moment here to uh, make sure that there is enough time for anyone else that has a question about evaluation to submit it. I talked slowly enough, excellent. So the question <laughs> just came in. Uh, the question is, will you provide copies of this presentation? Uh, the answer is yes. I'm actually going to let Brittany Totting, who is also secretly in the room with me, uh, talk about where our training resources live on the website. Brittany. I was going to use that as a filler, but you guys gave me a great lead into that, so thank you. Um, we do post all of our webinar recordings and materials on our Knowledge Network. Um, it's in, on the page, the AmeriCorps Program and Staff Development Webinars, which you can find directly from our Program Resources page if you're in the Knowledge Network. Um, we post all of those things uh, publicly. The, the presentation will be there along with this recording um, within the next couple of days, um, so you can find it there. All right. Great. Thank you for the question. Another question came in. You mentioned that grantees should consult with their state commission before submitting a technical request with NORC, with NORC. Uh, under what circumstances would a commission direct a subgrantee to NORC for technical assistance? So yeah, commissions can do that. Um, it is, it's within your prerogative to do that. Uh, I would say that commissions should try to use your own commission investment fund resources when you can, um, because you know, hopefully you have set up systems within your state to do evaluation technical assistance as well. Um, but if you are in need of some additional guidance or the subgrantee needs some additional guidance, there's no reason why commissions can't direct subgrantees to the evaluation TA portal. So thanks for that question. I'm going to keep it open for just a little bit longer to see if any other questions come in. All right, we have given it the, uh, the pause time. It looks like we don't have any other questions. So uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up for today. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. Again, uh, this recording will be posted, so you can uh, take a look at it again if you need to. But um, biggest takeaway, please do seek out evaluation support, resources, technical assistance uh, as you need it. Um, and uh, we're always uh, happy to help answer your questions. So thanks so much, and have a great rest of your day.